Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Just to introduce myself, I am Dave Entwistle, the chairman of IMACI Aerospace Northwest Committee, where we aim to bring you lectures throughout the year on all things aerospace. Today, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Michael Brash. Michael holds the Thomas Professorship in the Ohio University School of Electronic, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He is a principal investigator with the Ohio University Avionics Engineering Center and has performed navigation system research for over 30 years, serving as a technical advisor to the US FAA and the ICAO. Mike has taught inertial navigation short courses all in, <clears throat> at all three of the US manufacturers of navigation grade inertial systems, which are Honeywell, Kerfoot, Northrop Grumman, uh, and uh, Mike has also served on the RTCA working group developing standards for civil aviation applications of GNSS aided inertial navigation. If you have any questions, please enter them via the chat box at any any time during the lecture. And through I Rulan, a senior lecturer from Salford University's Aeronautics Department, will then collate the questions for Mike to answer at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'll now hand you over to Mike to start the lecture. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you to everyone for, for uh, attending. The title of the talk is Inertial Plus, the Once and Future Navigation System, and my aim uh, throughout this talk is to uh, emphasize the fundamental role that inertial navigation plays in uh, the aerospace industry, certainly with a variety of platforms, uh, but also in other areas as well. And what we will see is that the inertial system forms the heart of the guidance navigation control system for most platforms, uh, but in modern times it has been aided uh, with a variety of sources. What does the future hold? The future holds inertial plus something else. Plus what? Well, plus whatever we happen to be aiding with at the time. But in order to appreciate that, let's uh, get into the details. So what is the overview I'm going to be presenting today? Well, first of all, uh, explain a little bit more about my assertion that inertial is so fundamentally important. And we'll go through some of the uh, operating principles of inertial and talk about its error characteristics, which will then motivate us to search out uh, aiding architectures and aiding sources and and issues that uh, we confront when aiding the inertial system. As Dave mentioned, uh, please uh, uh, submit your questions as they come along. I look forward to discussing them at the end of our session. So why inertial? Well, one sensor suite of typically a triad of orthogonal accelerometers and a triad of orthogonal gyroscopes allows us to determine not only position and velocity, but also attitude as well. Inertial sensors uh, have, the, have the privilege of being uh, immune to interference and jamming uh, with, within most reasonable uh, scenarios. Inertial systems provide high data rates and essentially, uh, well, nearly zero latency. The, uh, the data is nearly instantaneous. Uh, and it's relatively noise free in the short term. However, of course, it has one Achilles heel, which is that over the long term, it has poor accuracy. The system is not stable uh, in the sense that the errors do drift and grow with time. So this is an example of a modern inertial system. What you can see in the upper right of the slide is the inertial sensor assembly. And uh, you see at the bottom and at the left are a couple of disks 
Uh, those are two of the three gyroscopes. The accelerometers are buried in the center of the assembly, and it's, they're not visible in this picture. Uh, the remainder of the, of the box, of course, is just the support electronics. So how do we deal with the long-term error growth that we will see some examples of later in the presentation? One, of course, is simply to live with it. You're on a commercial flight, you're flying from New York to London, uh, and you're off by roughly 10 miles by the time you enter British airspace, assuming you have a so-called navigation-grade inertial measurement unit. And certainly, for the many, many years of uh, commercial transport history, uh, that was perfectly acceptable. However, uh, there are certainly many instances where it's not acceptable. And so then the next question is, well, how can we improve it? And the second option is to integrate the inertial system with some kind of independent external source of possibly position or something else uh, in order to correct or so-called aid the inertial system. So assuming the second choice is preferred, then, of course, it begs the question of what is the optimal way to perform the integration uh, and will the integration accommodate a variety of aiding sources? Well, let's start by first of all focusing just on the inertial system itself, understand how it operates and its performance characteristics, then we'll get into the integration. So inertial at its heart is a deceptively simple problem. You measure force. We all know from our training that F equals MA in most cases that we care about. Uh, so we measure force. We in infer acceleration, integrate once for velocity and one more time for position. What's the big deal? Well, indeed, the challenges arise immediately. For one, uh, what is it that we actually measure when we're measuring force? This is the so-called accelerometer sensing equation, and it governs uh, the most fundamental aspect of inertial sensing, and that is the fact that when we are measuring force, we are not merely measuring the desired Newtonian acceleration. Now, this uh, equation can easily be misunderstood. It looks like it's saying that the measured specific force is equal to the desired inertial acceleration minus gravity. But in fact, the, the correct way to understand this equation is that the measured specific force is the desired inertial acceleration plus the reaction to gravity. In other words, uh, if you have an accelerometer in a case that's sitting on your desk, of course, the desk is importing a force on the case, holding it in place so that it doesn't accelerate towards the mass center of the Earth. So if, if you have an accelerometer sitting on your desk, obviously, relative to the Earth, it's not moving. But the accelerometer will measure a force. But what is it measuring? Well, it's measuring the force of the table holding the case in its position. So again, what you're measuring is the desired acceleration plus the reaction to gravity. In the case of this accelerometer sitting still on your table, then of course the Newtonian acceleration relative to the Earth is zero. So the only thing you're measuring is the force of the case, or sorry, the force of the table holding the case up. And so the force that you measure is actually pointed up. And of course, that's the opposite of gravity. Well, as you can imagine, in an operational scenario, what you have is a combination. And of course, these are all vector quantities. You have a combination of the desired acceleration that you want and the reaction to gravity, which is, for our purposes, mostly getting in the way of, of the desired acceleration. So of course, Mathematically, we can rearrange this quite simply and say, well, all right, the acceleration that I desire is equal to the specific force that I measure plus 
the actual value of gravity. Well, of course, the only way to do that is in software. You have to have a model to compute the value of gravity and use that and add that onto your measurements in order to so-called compensate them uh, for the, the, the presence of the reaction to gravity. Now, it turns out that uh, how well you do this is a function of the accuracy that you're desiring. Uh, if you want the utmost inaccuracy, you have to deal with the fact that gravity doesn't actually point perfectly vertical. There are some slight variations uh, that are of concern if you need the utmost inaccuracy, and that's, uh, that's just something that you've got to keep in mind. All right, so let's talk about uh, w what do we do after we have done the gravity compensation. Well, obviously, then we have a measure, uh, an observable of acceleration. So then it's like, well, okay, that's easy. Just accelerate or integrate once to get velocity, integrate one more time to get position. And so, whoa, wait a minute. How do you know where the accelerometers are pointing? So there are two ways to handle this, and we talk about this in the context of maintaining a reference frame. The reference frame is effectively determined either by the directions that the accelerometers are pointing or mathematically having resolved them into some uh, frame of interest. So in the old days, and, and there's still some systems around that do this, but in the old days, 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, most inertial systems were so-called gimbaled inertial systems. They had mechanical gyros uh, that were used uh, in, uh, that were connected to the platform and then housed within a, a set of orthogonal gimbals in order to keep the accelerometers pointing in a desired direction. For example, have one point north and one point east and one point in the vertical direction. Regardless of what the vehicle is doing, the vehicle could be pitching up, rolling over, whatever, but with the gyros, the mechanical gyros and the gimbal systems, you could keep the accelerometers pointing in the direction of interest. And then you could then simply integrate to get velocity and position. However, of course, uh, such mechanical systems are prone to mechanical failure. And so in more modern times, uh, we have largely moved to so-called strap-down systems. And in this case, the gyros and the accelerometers are hard mounted to the case of the inertial system. And now the gyros are used to measure changes of angular orientation such that the accelerometer measurements can be transformed into the reference frame of interest. So the accelerometers might be pointing wherever the vehicle happens to be pointing, but in the process of determining the attitude of the vehicle, then you can convert those accelerometer measurements into the reference frame of interest, for example, northeast down. All right. Now, even that is not quite that simple. There are some other things we have to deal with, specifically the fact that the Earth is round and that it rotates, and that influences our reference frames. So we have three compensations that have to be applied in our processing. One is dealing with Earth rate, the, the rotation rate of the Earth. Another is the effect of the vehicle moving over the surface of the curved earth, which we call craft rate or transport rate. And then finally, there's a, a Coriolis consideration as well. So let's start off with earth rate. Uh, what we have in this example is I'm showing a, an aircraft and just, just pretend, it's not showing this in the illustration, but just pretend that it's, it's sitting still on the earth. Now, we're looking, in this image, we're looking at the Earth from the North Star. So you can, you're looking at the Earth from on top, and you see that the vehicle, let's pretend, make it easy, pretend that the vehicle is sitting on the equator. And the uh, black, red, gray bars are just a, a notional indication 
of the orientation of the accelerometers, the accelerometer platform. And on the left, we have the example where, okay, it's local noon uh, for the inertial system. So, you know, the sun is directly overhead. Now, assuming nothing changes in six hours other than the fact that the Earth has rotated, then in the right side, you can see that, well, the sun is you know, based, the sun's in the same spot. The Earth is largely in the same spot. We'll ignore the motion of the Earth around the sun over six hours. It can be considered negligible for this purpose. And so the only thing that's happened is the Earth has rotated. Well, we see from the picture, obviously, that the vehicle has rotated 90 degrees. However, in our gimbaled system, if it was perfectly gimbaled, then the idea is that you're trying to isolate the accelerometers from the effects of the motion, the rotations of the vehicle, but unfortunately, you've now also isolated it from the rotation of the Earth. You know, wait a minute, I didn't want to do that. Well, yeah, that's right, but you can't tell the difference. So uh, what happens is you have to apply this so-called Earth rate compensation. You have to rotate the uh, accelerometer platform to maintain it as locally level, even though, in this case, the uh, Earth is rotated. Now, similarly, what happens as the vehicle is moving over the surface of the curved Earth? Well, again, uh, fr from, a, from the perspective of the pilot, uh, they think that they're straight and level. But of course, from the perspective of the stars, uh, you know, a reference frame outside the Earth, um, you, you can clearly see that the vehicle is rotating. But again, if you do not compensate for this in the, uh, in the gimbaled inertial system, it's going to stay oriented in the same place that it, or same direction it was oriented in the first place. So both the, the effects of Earth rate and craft rate have to be compensated in our inertial processing. Finally, we have the effects of Coriolis uh, and you know, the fact that, that we're, most of us uh, are dealing certainly terrestrial applications, uh, um, applications uh, on sea or just over the Earth. We're interested in navigating with respect to the Earth itself. But of course, the Earth itself is a rotating reference frame and so Coriolis comes into play. You fire a projectile uh, either in the north or south direction. And of course, what happens is the actual path deviates to the east uh, because of the rotation of the Earth. And so, uh, again, uh, this effect has to be taken into account in the inertial processing. All right, and one more effect that uh, I haven't mentioned yet is what we call effective gravity. And what's being illustrated here uh, is the fact that if the Earth did not rotate, then gravity or the gravitation would simply pull in the direction of the mass center of the body, the Earth in this case. However, because the Earth is rotating, then of course there's also a centripetal acceleration. Now you say, well, why are you using centrifugal since everybody knows that's a pseudo force? Well, it turns out that when you do the equations and you're looking at it from the perspective of, uh, of a frame that's, that's um, frame that's embedded in the vehicle itself rather than the Earth, it turns out that the, it, it, the centripetal force ends up acting like a centrifugal force. In other words, it, it acts in the opposite direction uh, from the perspective of the local user. And, and, and we can actually feel this because if you uh, hang a weight at the end of a string, you know, what we call plumb bob, th where is it that the, that weight, that string lines up? Well, it doesn't line up with what's illustrated as gravitational acceleration here. It lines up with, with what's called 
the resultant gravity or also known as effective gravity, which is the vector sum of the gravitational acceleration and the centrifugal pseudo acceleration. Anyway, this, uh, the, the point is that the rotation rate of the Earth impacts what appears to be gravity. And so what the accelerometers respond to is not just mass attraction, but actually effective gravity. And so in our gravity compensation that we talked about earlier, you have to account for both of these processes. All right, so uh, this is the overall processing of the inertial system shown in uh, continuous time. In the upper left, uh, you see that we have things that are labeled uh, with the capital C as a direction cosine matrix. The subscript B is for the body frame, a reference frame in the uh, vehicle. Superscript is N for the navigation frame. So for our cases, maybe that's the northeast down frame. And what you have in the upper left, you see omega sub I B super B. Well, that's the that's the rotation rates measured by the gyros. And so the upper left process is the attitude determination. Uh, and this example here is with uh, direction cosine matrix. You could do it with Euler angles, pitch roll, yaw. You can do it with things called quaternions. There's various ways to represent attitude, but uh, this is a common way to do it. So you update attitude, and what you see in the upper right is you can pull out the uh, Euler angles if you want to, pitch roll, y'all. But in either case, what happens is that attitude determination then goes into the box on the middle right, which is how we update velocity. And you can see that there are three terms there. The first term, the F is the measured specific force, and the direction cosine matrix is just resolving those measurements from the body frame into the reference frame, say, northeast down. The middle term is accounting for earth rate, craft rate, Coriolis, and then the term on the right is the gravity compensation. And we integrate, and in the bottom right, you can see that we have updated velocity. Then uh, going to the bottom left, what happens is you need your velocity in order to compute the components of Earth, uh, uh, well, of uh, Earth rate and, sorry, of craft rate. And what that gets used to update the uh, position. Now, that may not be quite obvious, but what happens is we can, we can compute position in multiple ways, certainly lat long wander, or sorry, I'll get to that in a minute. Latitude and longitude is one way to do it, uh, but it is uh, fairly common since, of course, uh, longitude all converges at the poles, then it is more robust to use another method of of computing position angles and direction cosine matrices are one way to do that. But uh, the important thing is, as is obvious, it's the computed velocity which is driving this process. As we know, we integrate velocity to get position. All right, so let's move on with that very brief uh, overview. So what is it with inertial that uh, goes wrong. And we've got a variety of errors. We're just going to touch on them briefly and continue. So a lot of different inertial errors. You have imperfect mounting of the sensors in the box, imperfect mounting of the box in the vehicle, initialization errors. You need to know where you started before you can do this dead reckoning. The sensors themselves have errors. The gravity model has errors. And finally, there are computational errors. However, the big ones are the uncompensated or, or errors after compensation in uh, latitude and longitude, uh, or sorry, in uh, the uh, inertial sensors. And so what we have here uh, is an example of, you see in the, in the top of the slide, it's a 100 micro G accelerometer bias on an Excel that's pointed in the north direction. So 100 millionth of the, uh, nominal value of gravity. 
And what you can see is that the errors grow to a peak of three quarters of a nautical mile just from one single accelerometer bias. And this is considered a nav grade, uh, nav grade unit. Uh, you can also see that despite the fact that it starts off in the north direction, there is cross coupling uh, largely because of earth rate. And so although the error starts off in the north-south direction, it eventually couples into the east and, and they trade back and forth. Here's another example, but for a uh, gyro bias. And you can see there's an oscillation that's riding on top of a longer term trend. And this is very characteristic uh, of uh, gyro biases. What about noise? Well, noise in a navigation grade unit, noise uh, has a fairly minimal impact, uh, but you know you can certainly consider it. What we see on the left uh, is we have the result of uh, navigation grade unit with uh, with uh, accelerometer noise, and on the right is gyro noise. And of course, you have to characterize this statistically. But you can see in the plots the growth in the standard deviation of the position error uh, over five minutes in this case. So what happens when you lump everything together? Well, let's take an example of a flight from uh, New York to Istanbul, just as an example. And you lump everything together and you get this kind of behavior. It's drifting off at roughly one nautical mile per hour. Now you can see some oscillations, which we saw earlier from the uh, accelerometer and gyro bias. But when you lump everything together, this is a this is a typical kind of position error growth. All right. Well. For a long time, people like to characterize uh, inertial units in terms of that position growth. So say a, a nav grade unit is supposed to have a drift rate of approximately one nautical mile per hour. But that's a gross oversimplification. So if we look at it in more detail, what we can see is that it depends on various considerations, mission duration being one of them. So we'll take a quick example here uh, with a, some typical nav grade performance and look at the behavior. Now, this slide shows the black shows the sum, all of the errors and you get all of the sub errors taken together and this is the total position error. But then look at what each individual contribution is. You can see that over two hours, the vertical gyro bias and the initial velocity error have almost no impact. Uh, the accelerometer bias is oscillating, but clearly by the end of the two hours, it's the initial azimuth error and the horizontal gyro bias which are dominating the performance. Well, what happens if you look over, say, a, a tactical mission, just 12 minutes? Well, in this case, you can see that, wow, over just 10 or 12 minutes, it's the accelerometer bias that is clearly driving the total error. Well, what happens if we went on a very, very long mission? Well, certainly the uh, azimuth error and horizontal gyro biases are of concern, but the thing that was negligible before, which was the vertical gyro, now is the largest error source. What happens if we have lower cost gyros? Well, here's an example in what you can see that certainly for uh, what we would consider low cost gyros, half a degree an hour, five degree an hour, and, and of course even larger doesn't even show up on the chart. You can see that the errors start to grow very significantly uh, if, you, uh, if you have significant uh, gyro drift. So the question is, how do we get rid of that drift? And the way this has been traditionally done for the last 50 plus years or 60 years 
uh, is through what we call complementary filtering. On the left, we have two notional sensors that are the S is the true value, the N is the noise or the error. And what we're doing in the bottom middle with the plus and minus is we're subtracting the two sensors. Now what happens is the truth cancels and what goes into the filter is the sum of the errors. Now why would you do that? Well, if one of the sensors has predominantly low frequency errors and one of the sensors has predominantly high frequency errors, then what you can do in the filter is effectively low pass filter out the high frequency errors. You get an estimate of the low frequency error and you use that to correct the output of the system that has the low frequency error. Well, that's exactly what we do in aided inertial systems. A typical example is, of course, the inertial itself, as we just showed, has low frequency errors. GPS, as an example, or GNSS more in general, has a broad spectrum of errors, but uh, certainly the bulk of the errors are in the higher frequencies. The low frequency errors can be dealt with other, in other means, or at the very least, they just provide a bound to performance. So the idea, and in an aided inertial system, and this is just an example with GPS, you can use other systems to do the aiding, but the idea is that the filter is trying to estimate the inertial error. You're using the external sensor to give you a noisy observation of the inertial error so that you can estimate it and correct it. So because of uh, time constraints, we, don't, we can't go through the Kalman filter in any detail, uh, but it is, a, it is a statistical estimation process uh, it's founded with two fundamental design equations. One is the system equation, uh, which is a model of the various uh, states that you're trying to estimate. In our case, it's the inertial errors. And then you have the so-called measurement equation, which relates the measurements to the states of interest. Now this is the overall Kalman recursion, which again, we don't have time to go through. But again, the point is that in a typical system, the Kalman filter is estimating the errors in the inertial. Then we subtract them off of the inertial output in order to correct it. Now, because this is in a Kalman framework, then it means, it means we need to have linear models uh, in order to uh, satisfy, the, um, satis satisfy the equations. And you say, well, those errors didn't look linear. Well, they can be modeled as linear in the short term, and we use feedback in order to keep the errors small. So you estimate the errors, feed them back to the inertial, keep the errors small, and then the equations are satisfied. Now, this is an example of very commonly used error model. We need equations to describe the position velocity and attitude error. And those are shown here. This slide, again, can't go through any details, but they're available in the literature. Uh, what we can do is, is put together a state space model uh, that relates the errors to the states of interest. In the upper left, we have the position velocity and attitude error. In the right, you have the accelerometer and gyro errors. And in practice, of course, we don't know what the accelerometer and gyro errors are, so what we have to do is add them as states to the filter. So on the left, what you can see is not only are we estimating position velocity and attitude error, but we're also estimating gyro biases and Excel biases. So there are a couple of several different broad architectures that are used to do the integration. One is called loose coupling, the other is called tight coupling. And the important thing here is if you look at the lower left, what you see is that you've got so-called processed data, in this case it's GPS position and velocity that's going into the filter. And there, there are trade-offs when you do this, but in some cases, 
you're stuck with a, a, a an aiding source that only has processed data as an output, and so you're stuck with using it. What is more preferable is to do what we call tight coupling, and what you can now see in the lower left is that it's actually the measurements from the aiding source that are going into the filter, and it can be shown that that's, uh, that allows a more robust operation that is more, um, uh, uh, more uh, has optimality. All right, so let's go through a quick example just to show how it actually works in practice. Uh, this is a simulated F-16 trajectory, it does some S-turns as it climbs up to about 15,000 feet, uh, goes west for about half an hour, and then makes a turn to the south. And you can see that here on the ground track. The, the, it starts in the upper right. You see the S turns as it's climbing. Then it turns west, and then it makes a turn to the south. And here is the altitude profile. And you can see you're doing some step climbs getting up to the, uh, getting up to the altitude. These turns are important for you'll see in a moment. So we're going to model uh, navigation grade inertial, 50 micro G Excel biases, 0.01 degree per hour gyro biases, and, and the rest. And here's the results. Now, um, the position errors, given the fact that we're modeling, uh, I think I may have skipped over that, we're modeling GPS aiding, uh, the position errors are small. Well, they should be. You're using GPS. There's nothing terribly surprising about that. But if we look at the velocity, this is actually, and I didn't show you all the details of the GPS performance, but this is actually better uh, results than you'll get from the GPS by itself, much, much uh, lower noise. But a more illustrative thing is to look at the attitude determination. And what you can see is there's some convergence on the left, then in the middle, you see that the errors are gradually growing. The uh, dashed lines are the Kalman filter's own estimates of its uncertainty, uh, the square root of the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix, if you're familiar with that. So just if, if you're not, just keep in mind that the dashed lines are showing the, the Kalman filter's own estimate of its own uncertainty. And so what you can see is that the uncertainty is growing in this middle portion of the flight. And then particularly around 35 minutes, it makes this reduction. And you say, well, what's going on? Well, uh, there's also, of course, an order of magnitude difference between the, the uh, yaw versus the other two. So just look at the yaw in the bottom. And you can see that the error is clearly growing, and then it, and then it reduces significantly. And what's happening at 35 minute mark, that's where the that's where the vehicle made that 90 degree left turn to the south. And it turns out that the vehicle maneuvers are an important part of how the filter can actually estimate the underlying parameters. Because of course, if you're aiding with GPS, what are you getting from the GPS? Well, you're getting position. Maybe you're getting position and velocity. How are you supposed to estimate attitude from that, or gyro biases. Well, we don't have time to get into the details, but it turns out that the vehicle maneuvers actually can play an important role, particularly in this case, uh, in how the yaw error becomes observable. So that's what I was just mentioning about uh, state observability. Uh, just very, very briefly, if we look at the um, if we look at the error equations in the middle, the middle equation is for velocity. And you'll note that there's only one term that has psi in it, which is the attitude error. And you can see it's psi cross F. So you've got the attitude error crossed with the total specific force. Well, if you're straight and level, where is the specific force? It's up and down, right? It's just the reaction to gravity. And your yaw error, by definition, is also local vertical. Well, what's the cross product of two collinear vectors? Uh, well, obviously, it's zero. So the point is that in order for the vertical uh, angle, the, the yaw error, to become observable, you have to have lateral specific force. And the way you normally do that is through turns. 
that's how you make that um, attitude that the uh, yaw error observable. All right, well, what about the real world? So let's take a look at a at a mid grade unit. This is not um, it's it's not a consumer electronics version. It's also not the nav grade that you would get in a uh, in a transport aircraft or a military aircraft. It's 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 in the middle. You might call it a tactical grade unit, uh, but it's one that I have some experience with. So I just wanted to share it with you briefly. And there's a uh, the Novotel 628 is a GPS receiver in the upper right, and the STIM 300 IMU is a tactical grade inertial measurement unit in the lower left, and then all the uh, supporting electronics. We installed it in uh, one of our flight test aircraft. Our, our lab has a number of flight test aircraft, and you can see on the right the uh, chassis that we, uh, or the uh, cases that we install. And um, what I wanted to show was the result of a, of a quick flight that we did just to, just to uh, get some familiarity with the system itself. And you can see that we uh, did some loops around the, uh, around the airport. A little bit better picture there to see the uh, flight path. And what we have here is the uh, estimated attitude. Now, this is not error. This is just the total estimated error, uh, sorry, total estimated attitude. We didn't have a truth reference on board, so we couldn't compute, uh, we couldn't compute the error. But uh, just, just an example of some, some real data. All right, well, if we install the inertial system on our vehicle, the inertial will always be there. But what about the aiding source? Particularly, what about GPS or sat-nav? And of course, the news will tell us that it's not always there. About a year ago, Airbus warned its pilots that uh, <laughs> you need to be ready if the sat nav disappears. Uh, there was some, a um, couple of years ago, some studies of uh, extensive spoofing of GPS that was done in regions where the uh, Russian president were traveling. Uh, in the United States, the military does jamming exercises, and it can it can wipe out GPS in a large region. Uh, there's also been some studies published about uh, so-called spoofing circles, and effectively, you've got ships in a harbor, and their their the position is showing up someplace else, and seems to be orbiting some phantom location. So the uh, the literature is quite clear that there um, there's ample opportunity for the sat nav to not be available, or if it is available, to not be reliable. But the advantage of the Coleman framework is that it is readily extensible to a variety of aiding sources, and certainly many folks have done uh, a lot of work on uh, trying to investigate other ways to aid the inertial system. So we have some examples listed here. In the upper left, you have uh, an EOIR sensor, electro-optics infrared sensors. Uh, in the upper right, uh, you have LIDAR or LADAR, depending on how you want to call it, LIDAR scans of a region. Uh, and in the bottom, uh, you have what we would generically refer to as signals of opportunity. Effectively, every cell phone tower, every radio broadcast antenna can theoretically be used as a, as a signal of opportunity. And a lot of researchers have been using them uh, in order to aid uh, inertial positioning as well. So the bottom line here with this very, very brief overview of inertial and aiding uh, is that the aiding sources may come and go, uh, but the inertial measurement unit will always remain. So what is the future? It's inertial plus. Inertial plus what? Whatever the aiding source happens to be. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions at this time. 
Right, uh, good afternoon, uh, my or greetings from wherever you are in the world. My name is uh, Thurai Rathland and I've been given the honor of uh, chairing this uh, uh, questions and answers session. Uh, if I could just uh, have a look at uh, the any of the questions that have come in. So please uh, bear with me whilst I uh, check those um, attendee questions. Uh, right, uh, the first question from William Campbell is, uh, if an uh, autonomous land vehicle operates with long duration GPS outages when not in open sky conditions, example a two kilometer tunnel, and automotive grade MEMS, accelerometers and gyroscopes result in unbounded positional error accumulation, what type of odometry or vision signals can allow a vehicle to be guided autonomously, uh, SAE level four, with acceptable position accuracy? Well, I appreciate the question and, and you have certainly uh, put your finger on something that's uh, very, uh, critical in the research that's going on currently, which is namely, you know, as I just mentioned, what happens when you don't have GPS and, and you have a good example here, if you're in a very long tunnel, there's, there's certainly nothing nefarious going on, but it's just the simple fact that the GPS isn't available inside a tunnel. Uh, and of course, then this is also made more challenging by the fact that you're talking about uh, automotive grade inertial sensors, which are you know, obviously have, have very significant drift rates. So what can you do in that kind of situation? Well, you've, you've put your, your, your finger on, on two of the primary techniques that could be used. Odometry is just, uh, as the, the word indicates, it's just using the wheel, wheel sensors in order to get an indication of distance traveled. Uh, and use that as an independent um, as an independent check against the uh, position change that is being computed by the inertial system. That certainly uh, the, the Kalman filter certainly allows you to to integrate those. Um, there are some observability issues, of course, because the uh, uh, odometry is only giving you a measure of distance traveled which particularly if the tunnel is not straight, uh, could, could cause some, some issues. However, um, uh, well, let me get to that in a moment. You also mentioned uh, vision and certainly, certainly vision processing, uh, electro-optic uh, processing can, can give you various pieces of information. So there is a concept called visual odometry, which is a, a something that uh, as the vehicle is passing through a region, you get an indication of your change of position. But in the case of a ground vehicle, of course, just traditional odometry would be much better. However, what the, um, what the vision also might allow you to do uh, is to be able to see landmarks, for example. So if the tunnel had things inside it, signs or some kind of indications that something, things that were mounted that were unique to a particular position, uh, then you might be able to use the vision system in order to, uh, in order to determine, oh, I've identified a particular landmark, which I know happens to be in this location. And you can use that as an aiding. Another thing that you can do uh, is, is, a, is a fairly old technique, uh, which is called map matching. And that is the fact that if in the old days, what would happen is it's like the, the navigation system would show that you were uh, in, in, the middle of the, um, in the middle of the office building. And you say, well, I'm in a car. I know I can't be in the office building. I must be over on the street. So the idea with map matching is you would, you would move the computed position to the nearest point on the street with that being a, an, an estimate of your location. However, another way to look at this is that, well, if I have the odometry and I have a map, then uh, if I've got this measure of distance traveled, uh, again, integrated with the inertial, uh, then that can also give me a position within the tunnel itself. Now, obviously, you can get into more complicated scenarios where the tunnel branches off into two different directions and 
and obviously that uh, that makes it more challenging. Although, uh, depending on uh, depending on how sharp the turns are, then uh, certainly your attitude determination, the uh, gyroscopes may be able to uh, assist in that case. Uh, there is no simple solution. You, you're uh, you're talking about. Uh, a significant challenge, but these are just some considerations that you can, uh, uh, you know, that people are, are taking into account. Maybe I'll pause here and, and go on to some of the other questions. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, the next question is from uh, Doug Holden. Do we also need to adjust for the gravity of sun and moon and G forces of the vehicle motion? We have mechanical gyros, ring later gyros and fiber optic, are there, are there any other types? Okay, well, thank you very much. That's, a, that's an excellent uh, question. The, the first part uh, is pretty easy for most. I mean, if you're talking about, if you're talking about uh, s s applications in space, that's a different story. And, and uh, solar, lunar, gravity you know, uh, does need to be taken into account. Uh, but for uh, for applications on the ground, aircraft, uh, land vehicles, marine vehicles, things of that nature, uh, the, the effects of the solar and lunar gravity are small enough that we don't generally have to worry about them. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, the Earth's gravity isn't, isn't as simple as we'd like to make it, as we'd like to think. Uh, there is these variations in in the direction of gravity that we call deflection of the vertical. Um, but anyway, specifically about your question, no. Generally, for most applications, terrestrial applications, solar lunar gravity, we don't have to worry about. Now, what about the g forces of the vehicle itself? That can be an issue, which is why um, there's a couple of considerations. Number one is uh, the inertial the pre preferred place for the inertial unit, of course, is, is as close as possible to the center of gravity of the vehicle. Of course, we don't always have that luxury. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, there is, uh, there is uh, additional uh, considerations that uh, I didn't have time to go through here in this presentation. Uh, there are things uh, that are referred to as uh, uh, sculling which is as you it's a sculling effect which is literally the forces that are showing up on the accelerometer simply because of the rotation of the vehicle uh and and that's um and because the inertial unit is is displaced from the uh center of gravity so yeah that does have to be taken into account now the last part of your question had to do with the different kinds of gyros that we have and certainly the traditional gyros were mechanical uh, over the last uh, three, four decades. Ring laser gyros and fiber optic gyros uh, have been the, uh, the high performance gyros again over the last several decades. To this day, RLGs and fiber optic gyros are still the primary uh, high end gyro technology, but Specifically, to answer your question, yes, there are other types of gyros that are currently in various states of development. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Um, one is uh, what's referred to as, as quantum sensors, and there are a whole bunch of uh, applied quantum physicists around that are doing research in developing the next generation of what we call quantum sensors and uh they th there's there's different fundamental concepts that are being exploited in terms of uh taking taking uh, certain types of noble gases and and that have certain they can under magnetic fields, they will have certain orientations that can be sensed and, and, and they are stable regardless of rotation of the vehicle. Um, there's another class of quantum sensors that are referred to uh, as cold atom sensors, meaning you take a, a essentially a clump of gas and then, and then supercool it to near absolute zero, 
which they uh, do with lasers. And uh, essentially what happens is they can, they can throw this uh, cloud of cold atoms up in, 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 in a, along a tube, and then when they fall, uh, they're able to uh, measure angular displacement. I, I'm not a quantum physicist, so I can't give you a real good explanation of them, but, uh, but they are certainly being developed. Now, uh, in parallel, there are also efforts to improve significantly uh, so-called MEM sensors. So you've got these chip scale sensors which historically have been very low accuracy. But over the last couple of decades, uh, there have been initiatives to continue to improve the performance of MEM scale sensors. And it's not unreasonable to, I, I, I'm pretty safe in saying that within the next 10 years, <coughs> 10 to 15 years, we will see chip scale sensors that are navigation grade performance. Okay, maybe we should move on to the next question. Thank you, Mike. The next question is from uh, uh, Chris Daniels. How small can could a workable aviation INS system get? Okay, well that question kind of uh, tails right on to what I just mentioned. Uh, as, as I indicated, um, there, there is work underway to develop navigation grade um, sensors that are that are MEMS units that are chip scale units. Uh, it's still they're still in development right now, uh, but again, I think within the next 10, 10 to fifteen years, it is not unreasonable for us to think that there will be navigation grade sensors that will be effectively on some multi-chip module. Uh, there are folks who have wanted to put uh, such a unit basically integrated with, say, the GPS antenna, for example. Then you don't have any lever arms to have to deal with between the GPS antenna and the inertial unit. So, you know, the ans answer, how small can we get in aviation? I think chip scale is not inconceivable. Uh, you're not going to buy one tomorrow. You're not going to buy one next year, but within the next 10 to 15 years, I, I think uh, chip scale sensors for aviation are very reasonable to expect. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, I'll take this as the last question. That is, it's coming up to half past six in the United Kingdom. It's from Chris uh, Gadderay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. In the strap down processing equation, could you explain the relationship between inertial body and the nav frames of reference? Also, can the carbon filter be aided by other types of filter? All right. Well, let me uh, let me get back to that uh, get back to that slide. So, okay, relationship between inertial body and nav. All right. Well, the the body frame. Is, is just a, a frame, a coordinate frame that is fixed to the vehicle itself. So in the case of an aircraft, the body frame is typically uh, has the x-axis pointed out the nose, the, the y-axis pointed out the right wing, and then the z or z-axis uh, pointed through the bottom uh, of the vehicle. And it stays fixed to the vehicle as you are as the vehicle is maneuvering. In modern strap-down inertial systems, then the inertial sensors are making uh, are determining their measurements in a frame that's either in the body frame or at a fixed offset from the body frame. Now, the uh, um, so the uh, navigation frame is typically the so-called locally level frame. Uh, so we have, um, for example, in, in your location or where the vehicle happens to be, there is a north direction, there is a south direction, there is a vertical direction, and that is what the navigation frame is. Now you may, uh, for various reasons, you, you may not want the x and y axes to be 
strictly pointed north and south, it, you may allow some kind of an offset. But generically speaking, it's just easy to think of it uh, from, okay, I've got one pointed north, one east, and one down. So that's your navigation frame. Okay, here we are. Um, and then the I-frame, the inertial frame, is the frame that's basically fixed to the to the stars in our galaxy, which you know it, it constitutes a a uh, an inertial reference frame. Although for our purposes, we kind of cheat a little bit and we say, well, we're gonna we're gonna put an inertial or we're gonna put a reference frame in the center of the Earth, but it will not rotate. And we're going to call that the Earth-centered inertial frame. It's not strictly speaking inertial because, of course, the Earth is revolving around the sun. But over short periods of time, it can be approximated as an, as an inertial frame. Now, the reason the inertial frame is important is because the sensors are making their measurements with respect to the inertial frame. So if you have a gyro that's sitting on your table and it's stationary that gyro is still going to make a measurement why because the earth is rotating and <coughs> excuse me um so in both the case of the uh, accelerometers and the gyros they're making their measurements with respect to the inertial frame the frame that they ex that that they output the measurements in are in you know the body frame or whatever it happens to be mechanized in, but the inertial frame is the reference frame uh, that the measurements are made with respect to. So those are the three reference frames. I hope that helped. Uh, and then the last part of your question: Can the Kalman filter be aided by other types of filters? Well, of course we're we're not trying to aid the filter, we're trying to aid the inertial, but I, I, I believe I still understand your question, uh, which is, is there other kinds of uh, filters that could be integrated? Are there other kinds of, you know, aiding architectures that could be integrated? Uh, the answer is yes, although I, I would caution that there is some... Um, you have to be careful when you do it. And if I can get to that slide, what I wanted to show uh, was the case of the loose coupled filter. And the point in, um, in a traditional loose coupling, uh, we're almost there. Almost there. Okay, here we go. So, um, yeah. So what you see in the upper left is that you've got the GPS receiver, uh, but it's not just computing a least square solution. Typically, they have a Coleman filter in <coughs> in in the receiver itself, so that what's output is actually filtered data. Now, I know this doesn't answer your question because you were thinking about other things, but the point I wanted to make is that uh, you have to be careful because notice that, I mean, a typical GPS receiver will output data at one hertz, but what we can see in the lower left is that the, the data it com is coming out of this filter at a low rate, like one-tenth of a hertz. Well, it doesn't actually mean that's the output rate of the receiver. What it means is that we are decimating the data. We're only taking data at a lower rate. And why is that? Well, because the Kalman filter assumes that whatever data you put into it is statistically independent. Well, obviously, in the upper left, if the GPS receiver has its own filter, I mean, filtered data by definition is not statistically independent, not, not at its normal rate. So then you have to decimate the data so that you can approximate statistical independence. And so that's one of the challenges. We call this the cascaded filter problem. Uh, when you have one filter and the output is feeding another filter, you have to be very careful because all the artifacts that are associated with the first filter can corrupt the processing in the second filter. 
Uh, and that's just, just something that you have to keep in mind. Now, you know, uh, more generally, I think you, you, you may have been uh, thinking about things like, well, let's say I've got a vision system and I've got a whatever, I've got a particle filter or something that's doing the vision processing. And so I've got this filtered data and can, can I then put that filtered vision-based data into this more traditional Kalman filter? And the answer is yes, you can do that. But again, you have to be careful uh, because uh, the, the data that goes into the filter has to be reasonably statistically independent. Uh, otherwise, you'll get yourself into trouble. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank you very much for an absolutely splendid lecture. Um, you started by introducing the basic principles and then you explained where the uh, biases, the accelerometer bias, the gyro biases can occur and uh, how the noisy signals can gen generate all sorts of errors and also how to uh, get rid of the drift uh, using common filter techniques. And uh, the uh, application examples were particularly useful in, uh, I think, getting the audience to understand uh, how it works and the, uh, the operational realities of uh, implementing these systems. And uh, also an interesting uh, point was uh, why maneuvering, or especially turns, are quite important uh, in sort of reducing the errors. So that is uh, very much appreciated. And finally, you also looked at um, the uh, different uh, radio aids that have uh, sort of been used to uh, try and uh, reduce the errors, but uh, also the, uh, the, the spoofing of uh, various signals uh, and the dangers associated with it. And also the latest ones being the mobile phone uh, transmission uh, systems where you can grab the, that data as well. So what you have actually beautifully explained is how at the heart of it all sits the inertial navigation system. Over the decades, different uh, external aids have come and gone, but uh, at the end of it, it's, uh, it's the inertial navigator that uh, runs the show, so to speak. I was also impressed with some of the questions that were asked there seems to be a lot of interest in uh, miniaturizing the size, the physical size and, and indeed the weight of these systems. So uh, your explanation of uh, quantum sensors and MEM sensors, I think is going to excite, especially the younger generation. Uh, so uh, there's a lot uh, to look forward to in uh, developing these things. Uh, thank you so much for such an absolutely splendid educational uh, and enjoyable presentation. I'd also like to thank uh, the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, uh, especially the Chairman of the um, Northwest uh, Aerospace Committee, David Entwistle, for uh, uh, and, and the committee members for organizing all this. And, uh, and also, finally, the guests. I think uh, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss, a lot of uh, items to think about, especially for the future. And so uh, I would like to wrap this up uh, in a, in a very, very high note. Uh, so thank you very much again, Michael. And uh, I'm sorry you won't be able to hear the uh, audience clapping, but I think you can hear me. Much obliged, Professor Michael Brash. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and uh, bye for now. All right, thanks very much.